The reading is from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? he inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Father, we thank you for organisations like Open Doors that seek to support people throughout the world. We pray, Lord, that you will guide and bless them. Father, also we think of those who've been caught up in warfare and violence throughout the world. Father, we think about the situation in Israel and Gaza and in Ukraine and in other parts of the world where people have been deprived of their livelihood or their families or their homes. And Father, we do pray that you will bring peace into these situations and that your love will reach out to those who face suffering and pain and loss. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> About 20 or 30 years ago, we used to quite enjoy watching um, a programme on television called Starsky and Hutch. I don't know how many of you <coughs> of my era also watched that programme. It was about two American detectives who used to drive around the place in a red car. And um, they got themselves into all sorts of trouble and they solved loads of crimes and they got out of terrible fixes. It was a real, at the time, action-packed drama. Well, some years later, we spotted a Starsky and Hutch DVD going for sale in a shop, and Judy, being very generous, decided that she would buy one for me. And we watched the first episode. And it was really boring. <laughs> and we never watched any more. The trouble was, you see, that over the years we come used to watching action-packed drama on the television and we'd forgotten how exciting Starsky and Hutch were, but in their day. Now, I mention that because I think it's very easy for us to fail to realise how radical and earth-shattering the teaching of Jesus was in his day. And one particular area where this is very clear is his teaching about poverty. In the Roman world in which Jesus lived, the poor were called plebeians, and they had no rights. Their votes were considered to be of lesser importance than the votes of other people, and to confound their situation, they faced a higher tax rate than rich people did. If they couldn't cope, many sold themselves into slavery, where they were treated as little more than objects. In the Greek world, poor people were generally considered to be morally inferior. They were often accused of stealing, looting and lying in order to survive. A Greek philosopher called Plato wrote this, the man who suffers hunger or the like is not a man who deserves pity. So in this series on Encounter with Jesus, we meet a man who received what actually was a very shocking challenge. In Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will receive treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Now, what would have been shocking about this was not just the huge cost, that this man was being expected to give up, but actually the command to give it to the poor? Why give it to them? These despised people of the day, people who had no chance ever of paying it back, why give it to them? 
And so this morning we come to this uh, shocking encounter and uh, we're going to do so under the heading of live a life of extravagant grace. And the first point I want to make is that Jesus is the perfect example of extravagant grace. In verse 16, the encounter with Jesus begins with a rich man asking what is completely the wrong question. Verse 16, now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The young man recognized here that Jesus was a teacher. What he failed to recognize was that Jesus is also our savior. He was probably so used to paying for things because he had so much wealth, out of his great wealth, that he, he failed to recognize that actually eternal life is not something you can buy. It is not something you earn, it's not something you get by doing things. No, it is a gift of grace. As we read in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 where Paul wrote, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty could become rich. Later on in this encounter, Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, is going to challenge this rich man to give up all his possessions for the sake of the poor. But what the man doesn't actually realize, of course, is that standing there right in front of him, the one who he's asking the question of is the supreme example of the one who, for the sake of the poor, gave up everything himself and did so so that the poor could become rich. This is something that was realized by a man called C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was born into a very wealthy family. He was educated at Eton and Cambridge. He actually played cricket for England and was uh, regarded as, uh, as one of the finest cricketers of his age. But C.T. Studd gave it all up and he became a missionary in China, India and Africa. And he wrote these words, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. You and I have the hope of eternal life, don't we? Why? Only because Jesus, the divine son of God, the one who was immensely rich, he gave it all up. He became poor in order that we, through him, might become rich. He is the example and the inspiration to live a life of extravagant grace. The second thing that we see in this passage is uh, what I call the sphere in which extravagant grace works. In verses 17 to 20, although the, the man asked the wrong question, Jesus goes along with it for a moment, doesn't he? And he tells him to obey the commandments. And the man says, well, okay, fair enough. Which ones do I need to obey? And what follows is really, really interesting, I think, because Jesus doesn't quote all ten commandments. He only quotes five of them. In verses 18 and 19, Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. He then goes on to add another commandment, which uh, is a kind of positive slant on a sixth of the Ten Commandments, which is do not covet your neighbor's goods and so on. And he uh, changes that a little bit, makes it positive with the command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what's interesting about this, I think, is that Jesus leaves out the four commandments that have to do with God. Doesn't mention those at all doesn't mention that you should have no other idols or that you should put no other gods before God or don't misuse the name of God. doesn't mention keep the Sabbath holy. So why does Jesus do this? Why does he mention the commandments that have to do only with our relationships with other people? And the answer, I think, must be that the sphere in which extravagant grace works is in my relationships with other people. It is seen by the way that I treat other people. I may not build idols and I may not blaspheme. I may not take the name of the Lord God in vain, but the challenge that Jesus is making here is about how I treat my wife 
or my neighbour, or the person I meet in the street, or my parents, or the people I don't like very much, and so on. Do I show self-giving love and generous grace to the people who live around me? That's the implication of the commandments that Jesus refers to here. And that leads to my third and final point, which is the challenge of extravagant grace. There then comes the very shocking command that I mentioned earlier, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and follow Jesus. And as we know, the young man couldn't do it. We're told he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, I may be wrong here. I don't know whether I'm just trying to evade the issue, but I don't think Jesus is telling everyone that they need to sell all their possessions and give them away. What I think is happening here is that Jesus has discerned what it is that mattered most to this man. And he is challenging him and asking him if he is willing to give up the thing that matters most to him and to follow Jesus. I remember once hearing about a Christian preacher who was encouraging people to go out and serve on mission overseas. And at the end of his impassioned talk, he did a, an appeal and asked people to come forward if they were willing to commit their lives to serving overseas. And he was very, very excited when people began to leave their seats and to come forward at the meeting. And he thought this was wonderful. And then his only daughter stood up and she came forward. And he faced the challenge of, what do I feel about this? Am I willing for the one that I love to leave and to go overseas and to face possible danger in order to face the challenge? You see, it was very, very different. Was he willing to give up what mattered most to him? And the challenge of Jesus is, I think, a very real one. Just as he gave up what mattered most to him, in order to bring salvation to needy people like us, am I willing to sacrifice what matters most to me in order to show grace to another person? It may be a willingness to give up my precious time to go and listen to another person. It may be the willingness to give up my money in order to help another person. It may be for some sacrificing a career, turning down an opportunity, facing unpopularity and misunderstanding. Extravagant grace, you see, is costly to the giver, but it is, of course, free to the one who receives it. In verse 21, Jesus uses two words to sum up the call of Christ. Follow me. That's what the Christian life is, isn't it? He's following Jesus. And so we recognize that Jesus is the supreme example of extravagant grace, as he gave up everything so that the poor could become rich. And as we follow him, so we seek to imitate his example by being generous, self-giving, and truly gracious in our relationships with others. Just as Jesus was gracious and caring, with the way, in the way that he met and dealt with women and men, with young and old, with rich and poor. And following Jesus is also about recognizing that nothing that I have actually belongs to me by right. It is a gift of grace. And therefore I don't need to hold on to it tightly. I can hold it lightly and be ready to give it up if called to do so. In a moment, we're going to take communion. And as uh, Christy mentioned, it's going to be different from uh, usually, slightly different in the, in the fact that the bread and wine, we normally take it to where you are. We're going to ask you today to come and receive it. And in doing so, I want to encourage you to recognize that when you come to receive the bread and the wine, you're actually coming to receive afresh the free gift of God's extravagant grace given to you, powerfully symbolized in the bread 
and the wine. And as you receive the bread and the wine and then return back to your seat, I want to encourage you to do so with the determination that you will reflect the love of Christ and show that same kind of extravagant grace when you leave this place and meet others.